Hi, I'm Bobby, and I have a new toy. This figure is based off of Lon Chaney in the silent film The Phantom of the Opera. So I thought The Phantom would be the perfect movie to review. So sit back and relax as we take a look at this silent classic. And if you plan on disliking my video, I have a special spot saved just for you under the chandelier. The Phantom of the Opera novel was written by the flamboyant journalist, novelist, and future movie producer Gaston Leroux. When Carl Lemley, the owner and founder of Universal Studios, was vacationing in Paris, he met Leroux and was telling him how much he loved the Paris Opera House. So Leroux gave him a copy of his book. Carl Lemley read it in one night, thought it would make a great movie, and knew exactly who should play the Phantom, Lon Chaney. Known as the man of a thousand faces, not only could Lon Chaney act, he was also a master of doing his own makeup and could literally play anything. These two skills allowed him to move up from extra, the supporting character actor, the full-blown star. He just had an enormous hit in Universal's epic, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And The Phantom would be a perfect follow-up and be just as epic to house the enormous set Universal constructed Stage 28, which was the first steel and concrete stage built in Hollywood. Over 250 dancers were hired, and some scenes were even done in color. As you can imagine, production was a nightmare. The director, Rupert Julian, was a strict, pompous taskmaster, and the entire cast and crew hated his guts. It got to the point where him and Lon Chaney weren't even speaking, and the cameraman had to act as the messenger. The first preview of the film was a disaster. There were reshoots, added scenes, deleted scenes, and re-added scenes. It was finally released in September of 1925, at a final shooting cost of $632,000. There was a special clause in Lon Chaney's contract that stipulated that there should be no publicity photos of the Phantom's makeup so audiences had no idea what to expect. At the Paris Opera House, there are rumors of a ghost, or a phantom. In reality, it is a deformed man named Eric, who lives underneath the Paris Opera. Eric is in love with the singer Christine Daae, and through a series of cryptic notes, demands that Christine be the lead in the opera. After the show, the phantom takes Christine to his lair, and despite his warning, she takes off his mask and is terrified. She goes to her lover Raoul, who is more traditionally handsome, and begs him to take her away. But the Phantom overhears this plan, and develops some plans of his own. In the 1930s, Universal Studios defined the horror genre. with films like Dracula and Frankenstein. But The Phantom of the Opera came before that, and is the predecessor to the classic Universal monster movie. In the roaring 1920s, horror films weren't really a genre, they were more like darkly themed melodramas, and The Phantom starts off as just that. In the beginning, we get the goings on in the Paris Opera House, and how they deal with The Phantom's demands. We learn about the love triangle between Christine, Raoul and the Phantom, who we know just as a shadowy figure. And we hear, I mean see, different characters describing their encounters with the opera ghost. It gives us the plot and creates some anticipation for the Phantom, but it does get a little tedious. The movie is a classic because of Lon Chaney and he's barely in that first half hour. But once he makes the chandelier fall on the audience, the film picks up, and it becomes progressively spookier. It becomes filled with these suspenseful and scary set-piece scenes, like the unmasking of the Phantom, the scenes with Raoul and the Persian in the torture chamber, and in true universal fashion, there's even an angry mob. Because the film starts off as a drama, it sets us firmly in reality, so when the horrors start to come, it's even more unsettling, because it's the real world turned upside down. Also making the film unsettling is Lon Chaney as the Phantom. <laughs> Main attraction is Lon Chaney, 
and he is my favorite phantom of all time. Just look at that makeup. The eyes, the teeth, the nose. It is terrifying. It closely resembles the corpse-like description in the book. And to achieve the skeletal nose, he put a wire up his nostrils, which caused significant bleeding. And you thought Mr. T was hardcore. Cheney's Phantom is an escapee from a Devil's Island prison for the criminally insane. So at times he's medically crazy. And he rushes, performing evil tricks, like putting people in his torture chamber. However, there's also a tragic element to his character. During the Second Revolution, he was tortured in that very same torture chamber. Maybe that's why he went, BATS! And he does genuinely love Christine, but he's so ugly, she'll never love him back. And when he overhears that she's planning to leave, you just feel his heart breaking. Lon's parents were deaf-mutes, so to communicate, he would use sign language, body language, and pantomime. Then when his mother became too ill to use sign language, and he had to take care of her, they would communicate just with their eyes. Combine those skills with great acting, and he was able to convey a psychologically complex villain without words. His hands alone show so much emotion. You feel sorry for him, but you're also horrified of him. The rest of the cast is pretty standard, but I especially like Mary Feldman who plays a very genuine Christine Daae. Mary got a contract at Universal when she won second place in a beauty contest that they were having. When we first see her, she's an angel in the opera, and in real life and on screen, she was sweet-natured, shy, and had an innocence of another era. Even her reaction to Cheney's makeup was real. It was the first time that she had seen it. Depending on the version, the character of Christine Daae can be a little bland. But that very real purity of the character and of Mary Feldman actually works well in the silent film. Also working well is the visual design. A silent film is all about what you see. And this film has some good visual design. The camera work varies from exciting to bland. But what makes up for it are the sets. On stage 28, they constructed an exact replica of the Paris Opera House. It's spectacular, and makes you think you're really in Paris. Ben Cari, who had worked at the Paris Opera House, also replicated the backstage portions, which have an air of mystery about them, where strange things are bound to happen. Then it goes all out gothic, with the underground catacombs where the Phantom lives. This set creates such a spooky atmosphere, and is the perfect, nightmarish playground for the Phantom. This style of set design would influence many of the later Universal Horror films. The Phantom of the Opera grossed over $2 million. Audiences not only screamed, some even fainted at Lon Chaney's makeup. In 1930, it was re-released with sound. Music and sound effects were added to the silent scenes, and several of the actors came back to shoot new sound scenes. Except for Lon Chaney, who was under contract to MGM, so his lines were spoken by a narrator. Lon died later that year. The Phantom became his most famous character, and he is now regarded as a horror icon. Lon's son became a horror icon in his own right, and followed his father's lead by creating sympathy in his monster characters. Lon also advised another struggling and discouraged actor that the key to success was to be different from everyone else. That actor was Boris Karloff. As for Stage 28, or as it was later named, The Phantom Stage, it has been used for countless other films, even recent ones, and it was the oldest surviving stage in Hollywood. But then in 2014, it was demolished to make more room for Universal's theme park. But hey, it's only history. The 
The Phantom of the Opera has been told countless times. Even Broadway has had a crack at it. But this version has some things that the other ones don't, namely Lon Chaney. So I give it 3.5 fedoras out of 4. Now this film is in public domain, so there are several different versions of it floating around. But on the bright side, I think they're all for free on YouTube. So, thank you for watching Destiny Old Movies, and have an operatic day!